Good morning. I want to thank everybody who joined us. My name is Olga Atomanova and Ukraine Media Center of Green Forum starts its operation today. I want to thank everybody who joined us online. It's day 273 of the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian people and I want to introduce our speaker today. It's Alexander Horunjo, press officer of the State Emergency Service of Ukraine. Good morning, Mr. Alexander. Good morning. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Unfortunately, this <clears throat> morning is not good. We know about the shellings in the Zaporizhia region, which resulted in death of newly born child. Can you please comment how the last day passed? What are the consequences of the shellings? The units of the State Emergency Service made 176 missions and put out 62 fires. The city of Vilnyansk was bombarded by the enemy, which resulted in strike on the maternity home uh, where a woman with a newly born child was in, in that hospital and uh, the newly born child unfortunately died. Meanwhile, the woman and a doctor were were saved from under the debris. I'm, I'm not sure about their current condition. We know that now no one is left under the debris, the, which is currently being cleared. 67 persons are being involved in this operation, along with 14 units of material. The works are in progress. About the situation in Kherson region, we know that your that your employees are currently fulfilling the works there and it depends on them how soon the city will be reconnected to the water supply and to what's the level of mining in that area. Well, the situation is complicated in Kherson region. We cooperate with uh, all the power supply the technicians to provide the power supply to the region, but the en uh, enemy mined the area so densely that it's not so easy to fulfill the demining operations. We, we engaged 93 technicians, the paratechnic technicians, yesterday, and Kherson region is currently the, the most intense area in terms of oper demining operations. I was listening to the briefing of Ukrainergo chairman yesterday who mentioned that sometimes it takes more than an hour to demine one square mit meter of a territory and that that's true the enemy used different types of mines starting with pfm1 so-called leaves and anti-tank mines P pom anti-infantry mines and it was all used in co combination and many such mines are found under the aerial lines in, in the fields. The works are still in progress, but we take all necessary efforts to expedite the work fulfilled by our pyrotechnic units within the last day. Such units in investigated about 18 hectares of area in Kherson and demined 138 pieces of explosive devices. If previously Kharkiv region was most dense in terms of demining operations, now uh, Kherson region takes probably the first place and we concentrate most of our efforts in terms of personnel and our combined units. Uh, it's uh, 120 pieces of material and 452 personnel. And this territory should be cleared with the help of the engineering units engaged in the operations along with medics, pyrotechnics 
and other combined units so all these state emergency services are concentrated in Kherson region uh, talking about the occupation of Kherson and the right bank of Kherson region how many devices were deactivated as to Kherson region I want to say that from the moment of the occupation we deactivated more than 5,000 5, explosive devices and we investigated the area of 393 hectares about the buildings and government institutions we know that in Kherson region such buildings are mined very densely and some of them could not be demined, so that the decision was taken to blow up the uh, National Police Department building, and the same happened to the State Security Service of, of Ukraine. Do you think uh, similar decisions will be taken in regard of other buildings? Well, it depends on the situation. The State Emergency Service, pyrotechnics, work in both open areas and in the uh, in the city areas and uh, sometimes the territory is mined so densely that we have to take some hard uncomfortable decisions but there is no other way around it uh, since the density of mining poses uh, threat to the safety and security of the people, yet the territory is mined very densely and there is a lot of work to be done. We know that there were so-called resiliency stations launched. There is a map of such stations, which is very important maybe for Kherson region, and maybe not only for Kherson region, was the participation of the State Emergency Service in these stations. It was President's initiative and uh, emergency service gets involved. The heating stations, so-called resiliency stations, should be equipped by uh, local governments. Uh, however, emergency service gets involved in outfitting of such stations. We deploy the tents. We uh, provide the operation of the generators to supply heat into these tents. We outfit them with some uh, rudimentary furniture so people could drink some tea, charge their power banks and telephones. We work on that and we install, install these stations in the designated areas, coordinated our work with the local governments Dear colleagues, your questions, please introduce yourself. Victoria Shevchenko, current form. What districts of Kherson region were mined to the most extent? And or is the nature of mining similar across all the regions, all the districts? Well, apart from Kherson region, the, the, the Snegurivka region of Mykolaiv region was also liberated and we deactivated large number of a cluster ammunition there it's why are they dangerous because not always the self-destruction mechanism is being activated and they can explode at any time so taking for example talking about Snegurivka region we deactivated around 900 pieces of ammunition, including both anti-infantry mines, uh, unexploded shells, other types of mines. So the largest concentration of mining is near the positions which were occupied by the Russian troops. So it's quite logical where the uh, positions of our troops were located. We find a lot of cluster ammunition elements and the remnants of the shells so this is my answer to your question any more questions friends uh, lorenzo cremonesi from corriere sera from milano italia 
So, yes, uh, we journalists went in the region of fighting. We are, I was personally impressed by the incredible amount of mines you find all over. I found of some of, your, of the army unit, the mining was... Do you have an idea how many mines, I mean, I'm sure your engineer, your commanders have an estimation how many mines have been found or uh, you, you think the, the Russian put in the Kherson region. Because I remember going in the area of uh, the north side uh, along the river Dnipro till um, Duchani. In the area of Duchani, it was crazy. Every two meters there was a mine all over, or along the road, all over. So what is your estimation? And can you be a little mere, be more precise? The kind of mine. I would like to know about the little, because we saw this kind of leaves mine, very small mine, anti-men, anti-soldier, anti-infantry, anti and the huge mine anti-tank. Can you be a little be more precise about the kind of mine when they were built? I understood many of them are from the Soviet uh, era, from the so Soviet period. Thank you. Well, from the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Russian Federation, we deactivated more than 30... We engaged... Uh, our pyrotechnics were involved in more than 36,000 missions, and, and we deactivated more than 80,000 mines, out of which more than 2,000 aviation bombs and we investigated the area of more than 56,000 hectares. These are the total numbers, uh, the, the, the figures you know, for the entire territory of y Ukraine, liberated for the time being as to Kherson region. We can break down the types of uh, mines into anti-tank, anti-infantry mines. The enemy uses the M62 two anti-tank mines. It's a dangerous mine, which is, which is not so dangerous to people. It, it cannot be activated by people. But if a car goes over this uh, mine, it's being activated when the pressure on the mine exceeds 150 kilograms. Uh, then the anti-tank mines uh, PFM, uh, also known as leaf or butterfly, so it's made of plastic and with uh, minor pieces of metal. It's not so easy to find because it's made of plastic and you have to visualize it. Well, you cannot see it at once. Spe in particular when it's in the grass because it's green and it looks like a butterfly and it's dangerous because children can see that mine and uh, take it as a toy. That, that's why the adults should work with the kids. They should explain all the time to the kids not to come close to those mines and not to pick them. Well, I, there are there is a multitude of types of these mines. You can uh, visit the web website of the State Emergency Service of Ukraine or in the, the demining section of it. Also, there is a demining application on the phone that where you can see all the mines used by the enemy uh, from anti-infantry to anti-tank and mortar bombs and cluster ammunition and uh, MLRS shell, MLRS rockets, and uh, booby traps, and cannon artillery shells, all types of explosive devices, everything you can imagine, the enemy uses it in, the, in Ukraine. We, we posted a video recently, well, uh, 
because a apart from people, it's also animals which die from those mines. So there was a video with two foxes killed by a mine who stumble upon a mine and explode. We just want to draw people's attention to the fact that they should not go in the fields, to the forest, specifically in the deoccupied territories. It's very, very dangerous. Any more questions, Frank? Journal Newsweek. It's been nine days that Russian artillery is striking Kherson, specifically the districts near Antonovsky Bridge and along the banks of Dnieper. How does it influence your work? In fact, they did not influence our work in no way. I was talking to a pyrotechnics who are engaged in mining operations in Kherson region, but they continue to work even notwithstanding the shellings because they have to do their job. Well, yeah, there are some safety measures taken when they have to lie down to get in the shelter, but globally they don't influence the work of uh, engineering units, of pyrotechnic units, because if not them, then who can do the job. So yes, we continue to work even under conditions like that. A second, a second question, sir. Uh, I would like to know from your point of view, I'm not asking you politically or, or any yeah, judgment yes. about the, the government, but I would like to know what you think about the suggestion coming from the, some member of the, com of the government, for instance, Ms. Verashuk, to evacuate Kherson and Mykolaiv. What is your point of view? You think it's appropriate? You think it's, it's exaggerated? I would like to know your, your point of view about this idea of evacuating civilians from Kherson and Mykolaiv. Thank you. Mr. Alexander, we understand. Well, you know, this question is of a political nature and I represent the state emergency service. We're not a political institution for sure, but if you want to know my personal opinion, it would be more convenient for us to work if there were no people because, for example, during the bombardments, I'm, I'm talking specifically about Kherson now, not about Mykolaiv, Uh, so we would feel more safe to work because our service always thinks about people. We are created to think about people, to rescue them. And obviously when the shelling is in progress and there are no people around, it's more convenient for us. We risk our lives, but we don't risk people's lives and it's very important for us. Any more questions? Thank you. Uh, Tony Connolly from RTE, that's uh, Irish Television. Just two questions. I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but is it your view that the Russians are deliberately targeting the civilian population with mines? And secondly, the Irish government is possibly going to provide uh, mining assistance as part of uh, an EU training program for the Ukrainian Armed Forces in Poland. Uh, do you think that given the scale of the mining problem that that's something that you would welcome uh, to have that kind of support from uh, from the Irish uh, uh, military service? Thank you. Uh. Yes, I do think that uh, the Russians deliberately target the civil population with mines because otherwise why do we find the mines in the cars, why do we find the cars in the toys, why do we find the 
mines in the buildings why do Russians target the maternity homes they try to intimidate the people they try to create the chaos and use it but they're not gonna make it they're not gonna make it in no case and we are ready to react to any to any such cases and about the international help how do our international partners get involved yes we constantly cooperate with our western partners and they help in both in terms of material and the the mining devices and our last acquisition was Amtrak truck which is currently working in Kharkiv region in the mining operations and state's emergency service works with the Danish Refugee Council Hello Trust, UNICEF Ukraine, Representative Office OOSC, and many others. And obviously, we improve our quali qualification, but I will tell you something else. It's about time when we may train our Western colleagues and not the other way around, because the experience our the mining units are getting during these demanding operations now now that the ukrainian territory is so-called polluted with explosive devices to the most extent and now we have these extensive ex experience practical experience it's very very important mr alexander this is exactly what i wanted to ask you about Unfortunately, our rescuers have a lot of practical experience. Do you have some international partners coming to you with training assistance and at the same time trying to have some practice in Ukraine? Yeah, we had teams from Canada, United States, New Zealand, and Great Britain, they worked in Kharkiv and Kyiv regions, in Bucha and Erpin, and yes, they were they were looking at the way we're working. They have somewhat different protocols, but they don't have war, and but they're still curious about how it happens, and we uh, re react to such requests from them where there is possibility we. Uh, get them engaged in our operations we explain the way we work we have a uh, vast experience and exchange of inf information with our brothers from poland and we show them how the civil protection system is organized in ukraine uh, the western countries are, are very interested in this experience and our work during the bombardments, for example. So that's why there is a permanent cooperation with Western partners. Well, you know, from the beginning of the full-scale aggression of the Russian Federation, about 50 rescuers died, including pyrotechnics. And uh, our Western partners are being surprised by this fact because why did the rec rescuers die? They are protected by different international conventions. But sadly, we're in war with Russia now. You see what happens from the side of Russia. So this is the situation. And to summarize it all, a question about Kharkiv region. There were a number of measures taken. Can we say that the objects of civil infrastructure, residential areas, that they are already thoroughly checked to a certain extent. We understand that we are not talking about fields or forests, that there is a lot of work to be done there, but where there is a concentration of people, are such works already completed? Well, I can tell you that in uh, places like Izum and Balaklia, where the joint pyrotechnic units entered those areas the yards of the residential areas were checked 
but we still receive applications from villages and from communities so we still keep on working in those areas in the areas adjacent to the pri private houses to apartment blocks because the f first uh, task is the re rebuilding of civil infrastructure and the territories adjacent to the buildings and so I can tell you, no, we, we didn't cover all the territories yet. We still get applications from the people. We still get calls from the people in both Kharkiv region, because Kharkiv region alone with Kherson region are very polluted with explosive devices. And from the moment of the, of the entry of our joint teams to that region, we investigated 1,555 hectares and we deactivated 42,000 explosive devices there. And in Kharkiv region, yes, I can say it's a very dangerous area, very densely mined by the enemy. Thank you, sir. A any more questions? Please, last question. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we uh, just, you know, because this story of the mine, it's, I think it's a story which stay, will st even after the end of the war, will be a big story. We saw it in Afghanistan, in Iraq, all over there is a war like this with mine. The mine stays unfortunate for a long time after the end of the war. So uh, I would like to understand, you mentioned before 80,000 interventions. I don't understand if these are mine, we can say these are explosive mines of any kind, or just the number of operation. So I would like to make sure, to make clear. Are we talking about about 80,000 device mines and other kind of, of weapons that you found till now from the beginning of the war? And secondly, uh, I didn't got the answer. Do you have an estimation, an idea, how many mines, any kind of explosive mine, the Russian put in your in Ukraine from the beginning of the war, from Kherson to Kiev to Kharkiv? Thank you. Look, it's 288,000 mines were deactivated starting from the 24th of February. So more than 288,000 mines and more than 36,000 missions by our pyrotechnics. And uh, that includes more than 2,000 aviation bombs. But we don't know the exact number. We, we cannot even evaluate the number of the m mines left by Russians. B because it's about 175,000 square, ki square kilometers are considered a potentially dangerous areas including including water areas uh, where underwater the mining is going on and but we cannot evaluate the total number of the explosive devices left by the russia i can mention the number of devices deactivated by the pyrotechnics of state emergency service and maybe we, it will take de decades to demine all the territory because uh, even until now in Ukraine the explosive devices left after World War II are still found. Mr. Alexander, thank you very much for joining us. Dear colleagues, I will remind you we had Alexander Harunji with us, the press officer of state emergency service. Our next briefing is at 12 o'clock. We will have Vitaly Kim join us online, the, head, the military governor of Mykolaiv region, and we'll talk about the situation in Mykolaiv region. So bear with us, trust in our armed forces and glory to